Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh once again in this video and uh, it's basically going to be a response uh, to a misconception that is often raised by Shia 12ers who follow their scholars um, they say when they listen to Sayyid Ahmed al-Hassan talking uh, in his sermon or reciting the Quran that he hardly makes himself clear when he's speaking meaning that that he should satisfy the you know the the recitation of the Quran that they have with them and he also should satisfy the Arabic grammar that we study today now their argument when they say that he hardly makes himself clear and he's not fluent is just like the argument of the Pharaoh if we read the Holy Quran in Surah Al-Zukhruf we find that the Pharaoh says to Moses that you know he says he says about him that he hardly makes himself clear la yakadu yubin he hardly makes himself clear and he also says in the beginning of the verse am ana khayrun min hadha that i am you know better than than he meaning moses alayhi salam not so much different than iblis iblis says about adam alayhi salam I am better than him. So it's all about being better than the other person and using what, what was the excuse of Pharaoh? And the Pharaoh was that uh, he hardly makes himself clear. His excuse for rejecting the message of Moses is that Moses hardly makes himself clear. But to Allah's evaluation, Allah's assessment, you know, Moses السلام, was fluent. He was fluent in that the message of his was was simple, which is that you know Prophet Moses is someone appointed by Allah, and people should follow him, should accept his message and follow him. But the Pharaoh says, and his excuse was not legitimate, is that he hardly makes himself clear. Now. His argument is similar to the argument of those coming to Sayyid Ahmed al-Hassan and saying that you are not fluent, you are not clear uh, because you don't satisfy the Arabic grammar when you know his speech is clear and people have read books. Um, he has followers who are Arabic professors and Arabic teachers. So they didn't complain. You know, Arabic professors, Arabic teachers, they didn't complain and they accepted the message of Sayyid Ahmed al Hassan. While others have, who claim to, to know Arabic more than them, have unfortunately uh, denied the message of Sayyid Ahmed al Hassan. Add to that, like Moses, peace be upon him, he admits saying that Harun afsahu minni lisanan, that Harun in Surah Al Qasas. Uh, Moses, peace be upon him, says that Harun is better uh, than Moses. Like Moses says that Harun is better than me in in terms of like fasaha, in terms of fluency. But according to Allah, Moses السلام, is from the five prophets of intensibility, awliya azm. Harun is not from among them. And Moses is better than Harun. So the rank of Moses السلام, was better than Harun. Yet he admits saying that Harun, Harun, whom he is better than in rank, in terms of faith, Harun is better in fluency. And so, and he because he's from Ulil Azm min al Rusul, he is among the prophets of intense ability. So uh, this is one thing to keep in mind. The other thing is that. We read from the hadiths of Ahl Bayt السلام, about Isma because the matter here is tied to, um, you know, the misconception that they're raising is that the, like Sayyid Ahmed al Hassan, peace be upon him, they say that Sayyid Ahmed al Hassan is, is not infallible. Why? Because he should be fluent. Isma. Isma laysat bi zahir al khilq as what Ali ibn al Hussein salam Allah alayhi salam said Ali ibn al Hussein peace be upon him he said in the book Ma'an al Akhbar by Sheikh al Saduq that Isma is not something apparent 
Like you ju don't judge if someone is infallible or not through speech. Yes, through the content, through the meaning, through the meaning of his message. This is how you determine through the evidence and through the meaning. This is how you determine fasaha, fluency. Fluency according to Ahl Bayt is not according to your understanding and according to from what you read on, you know, in the English dictionary. Ahl Bayt السلام, have a meaning of fluency. According to Imam Ali bin al Hussein, he said, Laysat al Isma bi al Khilqa. It's not through the apparent nature. Thus, he has to be mansus and he has to be textualized. He has to be mentioned in a text. Why? Now, you might ask this question. Why did Imam Ali ibn al Hussein said that it's not through the apparent nature, rather through the nas, through the text? Because the text, the appointment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is an unseen matter. You can't and I can't choose the Khalifa of God. Allah chooses the Khalifa of God. If we choose a Khalifa of God, this Khalifa will misguide and will, will, can become corrupt. Our choice would land on a corrupt person. Even Moses السلام, when he chose 70 captains, that 70 captains turned corrupt. Because Moses السلام, is not Allah. Even Moses, peace be upon him, when he chooses, if he chooses from his own will, the choice is not going to be correct. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the unseen. Me and you don't know the actions of the people. So when we choose, it's gonna, our choice is going to land on someone that is that could be immoral, corrupt. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, his choice is perfect. He chose Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ali ibn Abi Talib, Al-Hasan, wal Hussein. And in the will of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa it mentions Ahmad who is a successor of Imam al-Mahdi, peace be upon him. This is Allah's choice. So infallibility is not through the apparent nature. Zahir al-Khilqa is what Ali ibn al-Husayn said. Speech is something that people hear. It is apparent. So it is, you know, the determining factor is not just speech, it is the message, the meaning of the speech. Ali ibn Abi Talib السلام, talks about fluency. What did he say about fluency? He says that, you know, he was asked who is the most fluent. He says, Al Mujib al Musakit, and the The one who answers and silences the questioner with a surprising question. If the questioner comes with a surprising question, the Fluent person would answer him, not only answer him, but silence him. This is the fluent person according to Ahlul Bayt. And also when he mentioned about Balagha, eloquence, what did they say about eloquence? He said, uh, one of the Imams, peace be upon him, that it's not through the Hiddat al-Lisan, sharpness of the tongue, wala bi kathrat al and not through talking a lot of you know, something that does not have uh, meaning, like just flowery language, so much vocabulary, uh, strong words, but no meaning, no content. It is through qasd al hujjah as what the Imam said. Bi qasd al hujjah intending to present the evidence and reaching the meaning, the meaning. It is not just a decoration, um, an embellishment of words, flowery language. It is about the meaning. That's what, uh, that's what really matters. And the message of Moses السلام, had meaning. The Pharaoh doesn't care about the meaning. All he cares about is that he has to be a show off in his in his speech. It has to be so attractive to the point that you know it's like he has to be like some sort of poet you know this is not the point the point is the meaning in his message allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, like didn't care about like someone who's speaking in a flowery in a flowery language what matters is the content the meaning the message that's what uh, really matters. 
And if you want to like, for example, look at some hadith from Ahl Bayt salam, there is a hadith in, in the book Ikhtiyar Ma'rifat al-Rijal by Shaykh Tusi. Imam Sadiq salam, was speaking. And then suddenly a man called Juwayriya, son of Asma, he says, you are the Sayyid of Bani Hashim, you are the master of Bani Hashim, and you make a mistake, Talhan, you make, Lahan means a uh, mistake in grammar. You make a mistake in your grammar. Then the Imam says, Da'ni min tayhik, leave me away from your misguidance. Because he's so finicky, so fastidious, so uh, picky in, in, in terms of Arabic grammar. Uh, the Imam says, leave me away from your misguidance. And so when uh, Juwayriya, son of Asma, left, the Imam, peace be upon him, says that this person, Juwayriya, لا يفلح أبدا that he will not become successful at all that he will not become successful in his life so this is the, the situation with you know Juwayriya son of Asma uh, trying to become picky with Imam Sadiq and we have people the same people today picky and uh, very fastidious when it comes to Arabic grammar, towards Sayyid Ahmad al Hassan, the Yamani of the family of Muhammad. And so the problem is that they are binding the Imam with Arabic grammar and not binding Arabic grammar by the Imam, peace be upon him. As if the Quran is bounded by Arabic grammar and not Arabic grammar binded by the Quran. They also uh, have this, um, you know, misconception and this pre preconceived notion inside their heads that they need to actually fix. And, you know, the seven recitations of, uh, you know, the people today have like these seven recitations. Uh, one of them is like the recitations of the Quran, one of them is Nafi' al-Madani, Abdullah al-Makki, Abu Umru al-Basri, Abdullah al-Shami, and also Asim al-Kufi, Hamza al-Kufi, and Ali, son of Hamza al-Kisai al-Kufi. These seven recitations of the Holy Quran are recitations of Ahl bayt peace be upon him. It came from like fallible people. The recitation of Allah is one. According to one of the Imams, peace be upon him, he was asked about the seven letters, like seven recitations. Then he said that, you know, these seven letters, that the Qur'an was sent in seven letters, this is, they have lied for saying that. Because the Qur'an came from one, and it is in one, meaning in one recitation. Like the Shias themselves admit that Imam Ali, alayhi salam, you know, he had the Qur'an from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa It was a dictation from Rasulullah. And he presented it to Abu Bakr, Muhajirin, and Ansar. And so, it was one recitation, one Qur'an. So why do you have like seven recitations? Where is the recitation of Ahlul Bayt alayhi wa Why is it in the list at least? And, you know, one of the Imams was even asked about why do we have these different recitations. He said that it's because of the different nusakh, different copyists of the Qur'an. And also the other thing is that as we mentioned infallibility and isma and how isma is not through the apparent nature. It is through that the imam has to be the mansur, so he has to be textualized and textualized by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He has to be appointed by Allah. And we also talked about, like we mentioned the recitations, the seven recitations, and the and how fluency, what fluency means. We are going to be talking about also a hadith from Imam Sadiq alayhi like um, Imam Sadiq, peace be upon him. 
he was with his companion Muhammad son of Muslim and he recited the verse وَلَقَدْ نَادَانَ نُوحًا He recited it Nuhan. But Muhammad son of Muslim uh, said Nuhun. It should be Nuhun, not Nuhan. If you looked at the Arabiya, if you looked at like the Arabic, um, it says Nuhun and not Nuhan. Because what's famous among the Arabs, it's that, you know, how you recite this verse, nu, uh, Nuh should be Nuhun, not Nuhan. Nuhan is maf'ul bihi. That Nuhan is like the object in the sentence. Nuhun is marfu'ah. Uh, that Nuh is the doer. The Imam, peace be upon him, recited it, Nuhan, maf'ul bihi. If we look at the Arabic grammar today, we're going to say that, oh, Imam Sadiq made a mistake. It should be Nuhun because Nuh is fa'il. But this is the recitation of Imam Sadiq. The Imam, peace be upon him, said to Muhammad, son of Muslim, leave me away from your stench. Meaning the rules, um, the, the, fastid the fastidiousness of Muhammad, son of Muslim, in terms of focusing and concentrating so much of, about the Arabic grammar. He says, leave me away from your sahak. Sahak is the bad smell of, of the armpit. And so he compared the bad smell of, uh, of the armpit to the rules, uh, the strict rules of Arabic grammar. And, and this tells us that Imam Sadiq salam, doesn't uh, exhaust himself with Arabic grammar as much as they do. He focuses on the meaning of the verse in the Holy Quran, not in terms of the rules. And as we said, we said that if we look at the history of the Holy Quran and look at the scriptures, the old scriptures, 1st century or 2nd century or 3rd century scriptures of the Holy Qur'an, the Qur'an doesn't have, like, before the Uthmani uh, you know, time, if we look at, like, some of the Kufi scripts, there is no diacritical marks, and you can look that up. You know, the, the, the marks on the, the letters of the Holy Qur'an, they weren't there. So, this is basically something uh, to pay attention to. Like, where did it come from, these diacritical marks? You should uh, find an answer to this. And who set up Arabic grammar? Who set up these rules of Arabic grammar? You see, it's a two-step process. One is that, first of all, the Arab linguists, what they did is that they looked at the Arab tribes, but not all of the Arab tribes. And that's why you have schools differing in terms of the rules of Arabic grammar, like the Kufa school differed with Bas the Basra school, and the Basra school differed with the school of Andalusia. So each school had different rules of Arabic grammar. They regulated the Arabic language according to what they uh, seemed fit. And so, as I said, that there is a two-step process. First of all, they, the Arab linguists, they would look at some of the Arabic tribes, and not all of them, and say, this is how people used to speak Arabic. So then, who took it? The Arabic grammarians took uh, the Arabic language or the deduction of the linguists and they set up rules and they regulated the Arabic language in this way. But what happened afterwards was that people disagreed with one another. There were different schools. Uh, there were divisions. One is the school in Basra, one is the school in Kufa, one is the school in Andalusia. Why? Because there was an incomplete deduction of the Arabic language. The linguists should have looked at all of the Arab tribes and not some of them, not only just Asad, Qais, Ta'i, the tribe of Qais, the, the tribe of Ta'i, uh, the tribe of Quraysh, 
uh, the tribe of Tamim and, and others. They should look at all of the Arab tribes and then deduce, come with a, the draw conclusion as to this is how Arabs used to speak. So the Arabic grammar of today is an incomplete deduction of the Arabic language. It is not complete. Yet people, you know, don't even take into consideration that language, the Arabic language, is, uh, you know, it is something that underwent an evolutionary process, just like English. English, you have like Old English, how the Anglo-Saxons used to speak, and then the Middle English, and then you have Modern English. Different stages. Arabic also went through this. You know, you shouldn't look at it just the first 150 years. You should look at it also after the uh, 150 years. And uh, also one last point is actually two points. One point is that, for example, in the Holy Quran, uh, there is a verse in Surat Al-Ma'idah where... Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the Sabians and the word itself in Surah Al-Ma'idah, the word itself, what does it say? The word as sabiun here should be as sabiin and not sabiun. Because if it's was sabiun, it will violate the Arabic grammar. And because what is correct, you know, this word uh, is correct in Surah Al-Hajj and in Surah Al-Baqarah. Very similar, um, you know, it's recited and read very similarly in Surah Al-Hajj, verse 17, and also Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 62. إِنَّ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَالَّذِينَ هَادُوا وَالنَّصَارَ وَالصَّابِئِينَ وَالصَّابِئِينَ is correct. Why? Because these three verses, in all of these three verses, it begins with inna. Inna, what, what inna does to وَالصَّابِئُونَ is that it turns into وَالصَّابِئِينَ because it's ma'tuf. Ma'tuf it means that it's coupled with the conjunction. There is wa and then masculine plurality what happens to the ma masculine plural is that it will turn into mansub because of the inna in the beginning of the verse so when it turns into mansub it becomes sasabi'in and not asabi'un now christian arabic professors will you know point a finger at us and say that your quran is not following the rules of grammar that you yourself believe in. So what is our answer to this? And as I said, is the Quran bounded by Arabic grammar or is Arabic grammar bounded by the Quran? This is a question that you should answer yourself. And lastly, you know, according to Ahl Bayt and this hadith is mentioned in the book Irshad al-Mufid, volume 2. The Imam, peace be upon him, says that when the Qa'im, when the Mahdi, peace be upon him, arrives, it will become difficult for those who have memorized it to accept the Qur'an that the Qa'im comes with. Why? Because the ta'leef, what is copied, you know, the recitations that the people have, it's not going to come into agreement with the Qa'im's recitation, with the Qa'im's Qur'an, because there is a recitation of Ahl Bayt And so today, Sayyid Ahmad al-Hassan, peace be upon him, the messenger and successor of Imam al-Mahdi appeared, who is the first Mahdi in the will of the Prophet Muhammad, because after 12 Imams, after the 12th Imam, there are 12 Mahdi's, the first of the Mahdi's, who was a companion of Imam al-Mahdi first of the close ones, first believers, and Imam al-Mahdi, peace be upon him, he's the first Mahdi, and he's an infallible. So when he recites the Holy Qur'an, people are going to find it difficult for him. Um, 
you know, for them to accept. For the person who is arguing against him, he's going to find what he recites difficult to accept, unfortunately. And so this is a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we should look at the, the content of what Sayyid Ahmed al-Hassan uh, has, whether it's in his book or his sermons. You should look at the meaning of what he says, whether in Sermon of Muharram, Sermon of Hajj, and be sincere in your research. Examine and just don't hear like um, any what you know what any random person says. Research. Look at what Ahl Bayt salam said about you know fluency, eloquence, Arab. Okay. And uh, you know, as as you know, some you know some Shias. Let me just make this one last point. You know, some Shia twelvers, they would come to us and say that there is a hadith from Ahl Bayt which says, "Arabu kalamana fa inna qom fusaha." Arabu, Arabu, straighten out our words, for we are, uh, you know, a people who are fusaha fluent. Now, if we look at what Imam Ali السلام, says about I'rab, you know, I'rab is not just describing the status of a word in a sentence. You know, in Arabic, you describe the status of a word in a sentence or try to place it in the proper place in a sentence with diacritical marks uh, that are correct, satisfying of the status of that word. It is not just this. It is about... Uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, Yurad, I'rab al kalam, he says, Yurad, inna ma yurad, I'rab al kalam wa taqweemah, liyuqawwima la amala wa yuhadibuha. What is uh, meant, what is meant by I'rab al kalam, straightening the words, wa taqweemah, and taqweemah, uh, and, and fixing it, it means, liyuqawwima la amala, it means to straighten out. Straighten out the amal, the works, the deeds, what you have and make them um, appear in the best way. So you straighten your words in order so that your actions become straight. This is what uh, Imam Ali السلام, meant about Arab. Yet, you know, when uh, Bilal was being shamed for not speaking fluently in his Arabic. Imam Ali Salam says that it means straightening your words up so that your actions become straight. This is the understanding of Ali ibn Abi Talib in terms of I'rab. And also I want to add is that there is a hadith from Ahl Bayt salam which says that Ashabul Arabiya yuharrifun al kalim an mawadihu that the people of Arabic, يحرفون, meaning they change the words or put the words in their wrong places. يحرفون الكلم عن مواضعه. So an example would be that you know there are some um, Arabic religious scholars. What they do when it comes to uh, interpreting the Quran is that they would have their own agenda in order to, in favor of their creed, to like uh, take advantage of the rules of grammar uh, when it comes to interpretation. Like, in order to not make Ahlul Bayt السلام, included uh, in those who are well-versed in knowledge, like in the verse uh, number seven in Surah Al-Baqarah, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the muhkamat, وَمُتَشَابِهَاتِ Like there are two types of, of verses, like there are allegorical and there are those which are explicit. So then what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says is that قُلْ لَا يَعْلَمُهُ Say that no one knows the ta'wil, the inner interpretation, except Allah and those who are vested with knowledge. This scholar, what does he do? He uses the rules of Arabic grammar to his own advantage, to his own agenda, like in favor of his own agenda. He decouples the wow 
from uh, the previous line, which is no one knows the interpretation except the inner interpretation except Allah. Stop and start with and wa arrasihuna fil ilm. So to make it seem as if that no one knows the inner interpretation except Allah. And then start with a new sentence and those who are vested with knowledge. When we look at the apparent meaning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that no one knows the interpretations, the inner interpretation except Allah and those who are vested with knowledge. So he would say that the wow, the and, is wow isti'nafiyyah. Wow isti'nafiyyah, which basically decouples, this wow is decoupled from the previous clause. But it's not a wow isti'nafiyyah, it's a wow that is atf. Atf mean it, it is coupled with the following clause, not the, it's not decoupled from the previous clause. So you join these two clauses uh, together with the and to say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no one knows that Allah uh, the inner interpretation except Allah and those who are vested with knowledge who are Ahlul Bayt but some scholars what they do is try to separate both and say that only Allah knows and then you just start your sentence with and and continue on so there is some sort of deception going on when it comes to uh, the rules of Arabic grammar and that's why Imam Sadiq uh, one of the Imams peace be upon them says that Ashabul Arabiya the people of Arabic يحرفون, they alter al -kalim an they alter the meaning of the kalim the words and this is all what I want to add and والحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآل محمد ألمة والمهدينا وسلم تسيما كثيرة and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive me for any uh, shortcoming in this video and thank you all for listening